We are fortunate indeed at North Park to call him friend. Sergeant Arthur Moramitsu. In the early spring of 1942, during the cru crucial battle for Guadalcanal in the South Pacific, the Army found that there were a dozen Japanese Americans serving with them. They found that they were familiar with a very difficult Japanese language, so they were put to work questioning Japanese prisoners, translating captured documents. The Army found that they were very valuable, so they sent word to Washington for more Japanese Americans. They found that all those living on the West Coast state of California, Oregon, and Washington were all behind barbed wires. And that was, that's where I was when the recruiting team came to Tudor Lake Center, a uh, border of California and Oregon. I had never been to Japan or had gone to Japanese school, but the Army seemed very desperate, so I volunteered to go. I'm a graduate of Berkeley, California, uh, which in those days were rated one of the finest universities. But this, this uh, crash course that I went to was the most difficult school I ever attended. It's not just uh, trying to learn the Japanese language. They included uh, Japanese uh, military terminology, geography, everything concerning the Japanese military. But uh, I finally survived and after graduation, our 15-man team was sent to the North Burma campaign were attached to the 124th Cavalry Regiment, dismounted cavalry from Texas, which joined with the 475th Infantry Regiment and a Chinese Regiment. This became the Mars Task Force, a commando group. Our mission was to go behind, deep behind enemy lines along the Burma Road, cut off the supply and reinforcements. Uh, during the, uh, just before the uh, uh, one month force march, our unit met, and I remember one Texan asking the officer, if we're captured, we just give a rank, name, rank, and serial number. This is a standard procedure, basic training. You know, officer said, heck no, he said, they know all about us, just don't give the deployment of the troops. Likewise, we knew about the Japanese enemy. We knew the, uh, this oral battle gives the names of the uh, units, the commander, and so forth. We just didn't know the uh, capability or their battle plan. Well, understand the uh, before we started the one month force march, our, the Texans were short of manpower, so they told me to take care of one of the mule, pack mules. I've uh, never been near a mule before. <laughs> well, this is typical army. <laughs> well, well uh, we finally, uh, during, after about one month, we finally. I uh, made contact with the enemy in a place called Nampaka. It's up, well, the, uh, Burma is really one of the most difficult terrain. Anyway, the night of, night of the, bang, I mean, the battle, uh, the brass came to our dugout, and our team leader, he, he was a former instructor, Camp Savage. Uh, he went through all the documents brought in by the Texans, and at first glance looked like an overwhelming force bef uh, before us. But he reasoned out, comparing me with the order of battle, that they were mostly were stragglers, so the brass felt a lot better. Now, in uh, most areas, uh, there were very few Japanese prisoners. The reason was this. Uh, when the Japanese soldiers, sailors, uh, left for overseas, even the family, own family, tell them, don't come back if you're captured. Anyway, uh, during the battle, uh, uh, our team leader's name was Tagami. We went to the field hospital where one Japanese prisoner, badly wounded, was brought in. Uh, Texas, uh, Texan that brought in was very upset because many of his friends had been killed. So he told the medics, don't bother this guy. You know what the medic said? It's a human being, so we'll take care of him. Anyway, uh, after the uh, campaign was over, our team leader and I were assigned to take uh, Japanese prisoners to NB headquarters in Calcutta. Uh, after we, when we got there, we were all dressed in GI uniform. NP looked at three of us and said, which one's a POW? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we, went, we, uh, we went to uh, New Delhi, and I was assigned to the Office of Strategic Service, OSS, which is now called the CIA. I had three men under me, and we, 
And our job was to interrogate Japanese prisoners. And there were a bunch of other teams doing the same thing. This was in preparation for the invasion of Japan. Uh, one day, uh, one of the OSS officers wanted me to go with them to see uh, questions on Japanese women prisoners. They, they were nurses captured, they were wounded. So I went to this uh, British hospital. And after talking for a while, uh, the officer said, asked him if they want to go to the United States. They all said, yes, yes. You know. Then they said, I marry one of us. And they all said, no, no. <laughs> uh, evidently, women felt the same as the men. Uh, they were disgraced because they were captured. Well, anyway, uh, in retrospect, I was thinking about the time that the army put us all in the camps uh, because they didn't trust us. 33,000 Japanese Americans served at the 442nd in Europe. 6,000 served in the Pacific. And uh, ones in the Pacific, uh, of course, I'm familiar with them. Uh, General MacArthur had over 1,000 serving at Brisbane, head, uh, that is headquartered in Australia. And they were, uh, they were deciphering, translating all these different uh, captured documents and resulting in some of the major naval victory. And I remember uh, during the bloody battle for uh, Okinawa, uh, there's one instance where the uh, army found out that the Japanese troops were going underground in the caves. And then after the Americans passed by, they were coming and attacked from behind. So that, they wanted the MIS people to start getting these uh, soldiers out of there. <coughs> and these language men found out there were a lot of Okinawa civilians hiding in the dugout, I mean a cave. They'd been told by the Japanese soldiers that Americans would rape the women, torture them, and so forth. However, this particular instance, uh, evidently they were starving and thirsty, so they decided to send up a little youngster, feeling the American can be that bad. Well, the youngster came up. He came down with all those uh, goodies. So finally, they decided to send up one old lady. And she, same thing happened to her. She came down with all kinds of goodies. So finally, the rest of them started to come up, except for the soldiers. They either committed suicide or wanted to fight, so the cave had to be sealed. Now, I just want to uh, mention that one in the uh, latter part of the uh, European War, element of the 522nd Field Artillery, Japanese Americans, were the first ones to open up the gate of Dachau concentration camps. When the army found this out, they told these men, don't say anything. The reason was this, many of these men had their own family locked up in this internment center. And uh, you know, in this country, both our mothers are high honored by the community and by the government. But unfortunately, very sad to say, over hundreds, hundreds of both our mothers were locked up in these camps. And I knew some of the families. Matter of fact, one family, the son was a classmate of mine at Berkeley. So this is one of the very sad legacy of World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if anyone has a question for Art Morimitsu, please uh, ask it now. Art, uh, did you say, was that Dachau that the 522nd opened? Field Artillery. Yes. Oh, yes. I understand the, uh, the very number of Jewish organizations still of Israel honored these soldiers after they found this out. This was kept, matter of fact, even the uh, the MIS story was kept quiet for the longest time, especially during wartime. They didn't want the Japanese uh, army to find out. I might add that at the famous Battle of the Rapido River in Italy, the 36th Division, the Texas National Guard, was pinned down by incredible German fire. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the Nisei, came and saved them. They were made honorary Texans for life. Uh, John Weeborg. Was property ever restored to the people from whom it was taken? The question is, has the property been restored to the Nisei from whom it was taken during the war? Well, some, some people are fortunate to entrust the property to uh, some friends. Others, they had that kind of luck. I remember there's one story Senator Inouye mentioned this. Uh, one of his men was badly wounded. 
and uh, I guess on verge of dying. And uh, you know, I mentioned that he looked at some letter that the, the soldier received. He said, a, village, a vigilante had burned down his own family home in California. So they went through a lot of that stuff. Yeah, sir. Oh, let, let me say this. Uh, since, since he asked about the property return, I can tell you one thing. I was on the National Committee to campaign for the Regress Campaign. And because of the strong, tremendous support from American Legion, Veterans of the Foreign Wars, and the 34th Infantry Division. They fought off all those anti-redress. Uh, uh, we had some group that attacked us, but when you have five million national, I mean, American Legion, they supported us. So members of Congress obeyed what they, what they had to do, you know. See, the American Legion, veterans, they didn't, they didn't worry about the loss of property, but taking away constitu constitutional rights, that was a no-no for them. <laughs>